The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man by James Weldon Johnson Recording by James K. White Preface to the Original Edition of 1912 This vivid and startlingly new picture of conditions brought about by the race question in the United States makes no special plea for the Negro, but shows in a dispassionate, though sympathetic manner, conditions as they actually exist between the whites and blacks today. Special pleas have already been made for and against the Negro in hundreds of books. But in these books, either his virtues or his vices have been exaggerated. This is because writers in nearly every instance have treated the colored American as a whole. Each has taken some one group of the race to prove his case. Not before has a composite and proportionate presentation of the entire race, embracing all of its various groups and elements, showing their relations with each other and to the whites, been made. It is very likely that the Negroes of the United States have a fairly correct idea of what the white people of the country think of them, for that opinion has for a long time been, and is still being, constantly stated. But they are themselves more or less a sphinx to the whites. It is curiously interesting and even vitally important to know what are the thoughts of ten millions of them concerning the people among whom they live. In these pages, it is as though a veil had been drawn aside. The reader is given a view of the inner life of the Negro in America, is initiated into the Freemasonry, as it were, of the race. These pages also reveal the unsuspected fact that prejudice against the Negro is exerting a pressure which, in New York and other large cities where the opportunity is open, is actually and constantly forcing an unascertainable number of fair-complexioned colored people over into the white race. In this book, the reader is given a glimpse behind the scenes of this race drama which is being here enacted. He is taken upon an elevation where he can catch a bird's-eye view of the conflict which is being waged. The Publishers Chapter 1 I know that in writing the following pages I am divulging the great secret of my life, the secret which for some years I have guarded far more carefully than any of my earthly possessions, and it is a curious study to me to analyze the motives which prompt me to do it. I feel that I am led by the same impulse which forces the unfound out criminal to take somebody into his confidence, although he knows that the act is likely, even almost certain, to lead to his undoing. I know that I am playing with fire, and I feel the thrill which accompanies that most fascinating pastime. And back of it all, I think I find a sort of savage and diabolical desire to gather up all the little tragedies of my life, and turn them into a practical joke on society. And, too, I suffer a vague feeling of unsatisfaction, of regret, of almost remorse, from which I am seeking relief and of which I shall speak in the last paragraph of this account. I was born in a little town of Georgia a few years after the close of the Civil War. I shall not mention the name of the town, because there are people still living there who could be connected with this narrative. I have only a faint recollection of the place of my birth. At times I can close my eyes and call up in a dreamlike way things that seem to have happened ages ago in some other world. I can see in this half-vision a little house. I'm quite sure it was not a large one. I can remember that flowers grew in the front yard, and that around each bed of flowers was a hedge of varicolored glass bottles stuck in the ground neck down. I remember that once, while playing around in the sand, I became curious to know whether or not the bottles grew as the flowers did, and I proceeded to dig them up to find out. The investigation brought me a terrific spanking, which indelibly fixed the incident in my mind. I can remember, too, that behind the house was a shed, under which stood two or three wooden wash-tubs. These tubs were the earliest aversion of my life, for regularly on certain evenings I was plunged into one of them, and scrubbed until my skin ached. I can remember to this day the pain caused by the strong, rank soaps getting into my eyes. Back from the house, a vegetable garden ran, perhaps seventy-five or one hundred feet, but to my childish fancy it was an endless territory. I can still recall the thrill of joy, excitement, and wonder it gave me to go on an exploring expedition through it, 
to find the blackberries, both ripe and green, that grew along the edge of the fence. I remember with what pleasure I used to arrive at and stand before a little enclosure in which stood a patient cow chewing her cud, how I would occasionally offer her through the bars a piece of my bread and molasses, and how I would jerk back my hand in half fright if she made any motion to accept my offer. I have a dim recollection of several people who moved in and about this little house, but I have a distinct mental image of only two, one my mother, and the other a tall man with a small dark moustache. I remember that his shoes or boots were always shiny, and that he wore a gold chain and a great gold watch with which he was always willing to let me play. My admiration was almost equally divided between the watch and chain and the shoes. He used to come to the house evenings, perhaps two or three times a week, and it became my appointed duty whenever he came to bring him a pair of slippers and to put the shiny shoes in a particular corner. He often gave me in return for this service a bright coin, which my mother taught me to promptly drop in a little tin bank. I remember distinctly the last time this tall man came to the little house in Georgia. That evening before I went to bed he took me up in his arms and squeezed me very tightly. My mother stood behind his chair wiping tears from her eyes. I remember how I sat upon his knee and watched him laboriously drill a hole through a ten-dollar gold piece and then tie the coin around my neck with a string. I have worn that gold piece around my neck the greater part of my life, and still possess it. But more than once I have wished that some other way had been found of attaching it to me besides putting a hole through it. On the day after the coin was put around my neck, my mother and I started on what seemed to me an endless journey. I knelt on the seat and watched through the train window the corn and cotton fields pass swiftly by until I fell asleep. When I fully awoke, we were being driven through the streets of a large city, Savannah. I sat up and blinked at the bright lights. At Savannah, we boarded a steamer, which finally landed us in New York. From New York, we went to a town in Connecticut, which became the home of my boyhood. My mother and I lived together in a little cottage, which seemed to me to be fitted up almost luxuriously. There were horsehair-covered chairs in the parlor, and a little square piano. There was a stairway with red carpet on it, leading to a half-second story. There were pictures on the walls, and a few books in a glass-doored case. My mother dressed me very neatly, and I developed that pride which well-dressed boys generally have. She was careful about my associates, and I myself was quite particular. As I look back now, I can see that I was a perfect little aristocrat. My mother rarely went to anyone's house. But she did sewing, and there were a great many ladies coming to our cottage. If I was around, they would generally call me and ask me my name and age and tell my mother what a pretty boy I was. Some of them would pat me on the head and kiss me. My mother was kept very busy with her sewing. Sometimes she would have another woman helping her. I think she must have derived a fair income from her work. I know, too, that at least once each month she received a letter. I used to watch for the postman, get the letter, and run to her with it. Whether she was busy or not, she would take it and instantly thrust it into her bosom. I never saw her read one of these letters. I knew later that they contained money and what was to her more than money. As busy as she generally was, she found time, however, to teach me my letters and figures and how to spell a number of easy words. Always on Sunday evenings, she opened the little square piano and picked out hymns. I can recall now that whenever she played hymns from the book, her tempo was always decidedly largo. Sometimes, on other evenings, when she was not sewing, she would play simple accompaniments to some old southern songs which she sang. In these songs she was freer, because she played them by ear. Those evenings on which she opened the little piano were the happiest hours of my childhood. Whenever she started toward the instrument, I used to follow her with all the interest and irrepressible joy that a pampered pet dog shows when a package is opened in which he knows there is a sweet bit for him. I used to stand by her side and often interrupt and annoy her by chiming in with strange harmonies which I found on either the high keys of the treble or the low keys of the bass. 
I remember that I had a particular fondness for the black keys. Always on such evenings when the music was over, my mother would sit with me in her arms, often for a very long time. She would hold me close, softly crooning some old melody without words, all the while gently stroking her face against my head. Many and many a night I thus fell asleep. I can see her now, her great dark eyes looking into the fire. To where? No one knew but her. The memory of that picture has more than once kept me from straying too far from the place of purity and safety in which her arms held me. At a very early age I began to thump on the piano alone, and it was not long before I was able to pick out a few tunes. When I was seven years old I could play by ear all the hymns and songs that my mother knew. I had also learned the names of the notes in both clefts, but I preferred not to be hampered by notes. About this time several ladies for whom my mother sewed heard me play, and they persuaded her that I should at once be put under a teacher. So arrangements were made for me to study the piano with a lady who was a fairly good musician. At the same time arrangements were made for me to study my books with this lady's daughter. My music teacher had no small difficulty at first in pinning me down to the notes. If she played my lesson over for me, I invariably attempted to reproduce the required sounds without the slightest recourse to the written characters. Her daughter, my other teacher, also had her worries. She found that in reading, whenever I came to words that were difficult or unfamiliar, I was prone to bring my imagination to the rescue and read from the picture. She has laughingly told me since then that I would sometimes substitute whole sentences and even paragraphs from what meaning I thought the illustrations conveyed. She said she not only was sometimes amused at the fresh treatment I would give an author's subject, but when I gave some new and sudden turn to the plot of the story, often grew interested and even excited in listening to hear what kind of a denouement I would bring about. But I am sure this was not due to dullness, for I made rapid progress in both my music and my books. And so, for a couple of years, my life was divided between my music and my school books. Music took up the greater part of my time. I had no playmates, but amused myself with games, some of them my own invention, which could be played alone. I knew a few boys whom I had met at the church, which I attended with my mother, but I had formed no close friendships with any of them. Then, when I was nine years old, my mother decided to enter me in the public school. So all at once I found myself thrown among a crowd of boys of all sizes and kinds. Some of them seemed to me like savages. I shall never forget the bewilderment, the pain, the heart-sickness of that first day at school. I seemed to be the only stranger in the place. Every other boy seemed to know every other boy. I was fortunate enough, however, to be assigned to a teacher who knew me. My mother made her dresses. She was one of the ladies who used to pat me on the head and kiss me. She had the tact to address a few words directly to me. This gave me a certain sort of standing in the class and put me somewhat at ease. Within a few days I had made one staunch friend and was on fairly good terms with most of the boys. I was shy of the girls and remained so. Even now, a word or look from a pretty woman sets me all a-tremble. This friend I bound to me with hooks of steel in a very simple way. He was a big awkward boy with a face full of freckles and a head full of very red hair. He was perhaps fourteen years of age, that is, four or five years older than any other boy in the class. This seniority was due to the fact that he had spent twice the required amount of time in several of the preceding classes. I had not been at school many hours before I felt that redhead, as I involuntarily called him, and I, were to be friends. I do not doubt that this feeling was strengthened by the fact that I had been quick enough to see that a big, strong boy was a friend to be desired at a public school. And, perhaps, in spite of his dullness, Redhead had been able to discern that I could be of service to him. At any rate, there was a simultaneous mutual attraction. The teacher had strung the class promiscuously around the walls of the room for a sort of trial heat for places of rank. When the line was straightened out, I found that by skillful maneuvering I had placed myself third 
and had piloted Redhead to the place next to me. The teacher began by giving us to spell the words corresponding to our order in the line. Spell first. Spell second. Spell third. I rattled off. T-H-I-R-D. Third. In a way which said, Why don't you give us something hard? As the words went down the line, I could see how lucky I had been to get a good place, together with an easy word. As young as I was, I felt impressed with the unfairness of the whole proceeding when I saw the tail-enders going down before twelfth and twentieth, and I felt sorry for those who had to spell such words in order to hold a low position. Spell forth. Redhead, with his hands clutched tightly behind his back, began bravely, F O R T H. Like a flash, a score of hands went up, and the teacher began saying, No snapping of fingers! No snapping of fingers! This was the first word missed, and it seemed to me that some of the scholars were about to lose their senses. Some were dancing up and down on one foot with a hand above their heads, the fingers working furiously, and joy beaming all over their faces. Others stood still, their hands raised not so high, their fingers working less rapidly, and their faces expressing not quite so much happiness. There were still others who did not move or raise their hands, but stood with great wrinkles on their foreheads, looking very thoughtful. The whole thing was new to me, and I did not raise my hand, but slyly whispered the letter U to Redhead several times. Second chance, said the teacher. The hands went down, and the class became quiet. Redhead, his face now red, after looking beseechingly at the ceiling, then pitiably at the floor, began very haltingly, F. U. Immediately, an impulse to raise hands went through the class. But the teacher checked it, and poor Redhead, though he knew that each letter he added only took him farther out of the way, went doggedly on and finished. R. T. H. The hand raising was now repeated with more hubbub and excitement than at first. Those who before had not moved a finger were now waving their hands above their heads. Redhead felt that he was lost. He looked very big and foolish, and some of the scholars began to snicker. His helpless condition went straight to my heart and gripped my sympathies. I felt that if he failed, it would in some way be my failure. I raised my hand, and under cover of the excitement and the teacher's attempts to regain order, I hurriedly shot up into his ear twice, quite distinctly, F-O-U-R-T-H, F-O-U-R-T-H. The teacher tapped on her desk and said, Third and last chance. The hands came down. The silence became oppressive. Redhead began, F. Since that day, I have waited anxiously for many a turn of the wheel of fortune, but never under greater tension than when I watched for the order in which those letters would fall from Red's lips. O. U. R. T. H. A sigh of relief and disappointment went up from the class. Afterwards, through all our school days, Redhead shared my wit and quickness, and I benefited from his strength and dogged faithfulness. There were some black and brown boys and girls in the school, and several of them were in my class. One of the boys strongly attracted my attention from the first day I saw him. His face was as black as night, but shone as though it were polished. He had sparkling eyes, and when he opened his mouth, he displayed glistening white teeth. It struck me at once as appropriate to call him shiny face, or shiny eyes, or shiny teeth, and I spoke of him often by one of these names to the other boys. These terms were finally merged into shiny, and to that name he answered good-naturedly during the balance of his public school days. Shiny was considered without question to be the best speller, the best reader, the best penman, in a word, the best scholar in the class. He was very quick to catch anything, but nevertheless studied hard. Thus he possessed two powers very rarely combined in one boy. I saw him year after year on up into the high school win the majority of the prizes for punctuality, deportment, 
essay writing and declamation. Yet it did not take me long to discover that in spite of his standing as a scholar, he was in some way looked down upon. The other black boys and girls were still more looked down upon. Some of the boys often spoke of them as niggers. Sometimes on the way home from school, a crowd would walk behind them, repeating, Nigger, nigger, never die, black face and shiny eye. On one such afternoon, one of the black boys turned suddenly on his tormentors and hurled a slate. It struck one of the white boys in the mouth, cutting a slight gash in his lip. At sight of the blood, the boy who had thrown the slate ran, and his companions quickly followed. We ran after them, pelting them with stones until they separated in several directions. I was very much wrought up over the affair, and went home and told my mother how one of the niggers had struck a boy with a slate. I shall never forget how she turned on me. Don't you ever use that word again, she said, and don't you ever bother the colored children at school. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I did hang my head in shame. Not because she had convinced me that I had done wrong, but because I was hurt by the first sharp word she had ever given me. My school days ran along very pleasantly. I stood well in my studies, not always so well with regard to my behavior. I was never guilty of any serious misconduct, but my love of fun sometimes got me into trouble. I remember, however, that my sense of humor was so sly that most of the trouble usually fell on the head of the other fellow. My ability to play on the piano at school exercises was looked upon as little short of marvelous in a boy of my age. I was not chummy with many of my mates, but on the whole was about as popular as it is good for a boy to be. One day, near the end of my second term at school, the principal came into our room, and after talking to the teacher, for some reason, said, I wish all of the white scholars to stand for a moment. I rose with the others. The teacher looked at me and, calling my name, said, You sit down for the present and rise with the others. I did not quite understand her and questioned, Ma'am? She repeated with a softer tone in her voice, You sit down now and rise with the others. I sat down dazed. I saw and heard nothing. When the others were asked to rise, I did not know it. When school was dismissed, I went out in a kind of stupor. A few of the white boys jeered me, saying, Oh, you're a nigger too. I heard some black children say, We knew he was colored. Shiny said to them, Come along, don't tease him, and thereby won my undying gratitude. I hurried on as fast as I could, and had gone some distance before I perceived that Redhead was walking by my side. After a while he said to me, Let me carry your books. I gave him my strap without being able to answer. When we got to my gate, he said as he handed me my books, Say, you know my big red agate? I can't shoot with it any more. I'm going to bring it to school for you tomorrow. I took my books and ran into the house. As I passed through the hallway, I saw that my mother was busy with one of her customers. I rushed up into my own little room, shut the door, and went quickly to where my looking glass hung on the wall. For an instant I was afraid to look, but when I did, I looked long and earnestly. I had often heard people say to my mother, What a pretty boy you have! I was accustomed to hear remarks about my beauty, but now for the first time I became conscious of it and recognized it. I noticed the ivory whiteness of my skin the beauty of my mouth, the size and liquid darkness of my eyes, and how the long black lashes that fringed and shaded them produced an effect that was strangely fascinating even to me. I noticed the softness and glossiness of my dark hair that fell in waves over my temples, making my forehead appear whiter than it really was. How long I stood there gazing at my image I do not know. When I came out and reached the head of the stairs, I heard the lady who had been with my mother going out. I ran downstairs and rushed to where my mother was sitting, with a piece of work in her hands. I buried my head in her lap and blurted out, Mother, mother, tell me, am I a nigger? I could not see her face, but I knew the piece of work dropped to the floor, and I felt her hands on my head. 
I looked up into her face and repeated, Tell me, mother, am I a nigger? There were tears in her eyes, and I could see that she was suffering for me. And then it was that I looked at her critically for the first time. I had thought of her in a childish way, only as the most beautiful woman in the world. Now I looked at her searching for defects. I could see that her skin was almost brown, that her hair was not so soft as mine, and that she did differ in some way from the other ladies who came to the house. Yet even so, I could see that she was very beautiful, more beautiful than any of them. She must have felt that I was examining her, for she hid her face in my hair and said with difficulty, No, my darling, you are not a nigger. She went on, You are as good as anybody. If anyone calls you a nigger, don't notice them. But the more she talked, the less I was reassured, and I stopped her by asking, Well, mother, am I white? Are you white? She answered tremblingly, No, I am not white. But you, your father is one of the greatest men in the country. The best blood of the South is in you. This suddenly opened up in my heart a fresh chasm of misgiving and fear, and I almost fiercely demanded, Who is my father? Where is he? She stroked my hair and said, I'll tell you about him some day. I sobbed. I want to know now. She answered, No, not now. Perhaps it had to be done, but I have never forgiven the woman who did it so cruelly. It may be said that she never knew that she gave me a sword thrust that day in school, which was years in healing. End of Preface and Chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man Since I've grown older, I've often gone back and tried to analyze the change that came into my life after that fateful day in school. There did come a radical change, and young as I was, I felt fully conscious of it, though I did not fully comprehend it. Like my first spanking, it is one of the few incidents in my life that I can remember clearly. In the life of everyone, there is a limited number of unhappy experiences, which are not written upon the memory, but stamped there with a die, and in long years after, they can be called up in detail, and every emotion that was stirred by them can be lived through anew. These are the tragedies of life. We may grow to include some of them among the trivial incidents of childhood, a broken toy, a promise made to us which was not kept, a harsh, heart-piercing word. But these two, as well as the bitter experiences and disappointments of mature years, are the tragedies of life. And so I have often lived through that hour, that day, that week, in which was wrought the miracle of my transition from one world into another, for I did indeed pass into another world. From that time I looked out through other eyes. My thoughts were colored, my words dictated, my actions limited by one dominating, all-pervading idea which constantly increased in force and weight until I finally realized in it a great tangible fact. And this is the dwarfing, warping, distorting influence which operates upon each and every colored man in the United States. He is forced to take his outlook on all things, not from the viewpoint of a citizen or a man or even a human being, but from the viewpoint of a colored man. It is wonderful to me that the race has progressed so broadly as it has, since most of its thought and all of its activity must run through the narrow neck of this one funnel. And it is this, too, which makes the colored people of this country, in reality, a mystery to the whites. It is a difficult thing for a white man to learn what a colored man really thinks, because generally, with the latter, an additional and different light must be brought to bear on what he thinks. And his thoughts are often influenced by considerations so delicate and subtle that it would be impossible for him to confess or explain them to one of the opposite race. This gives to every colored man, in proportion to his intellectuality, a sort of dual personality. There is one phase of him which is disclosed only in the Freemasonry of his own race. I have often watched with interest and sometimes with amazement even ignorant colored men, under cover of broad grins and minstrel antics, maintain this dualism in the presence of white men. 
I believe it to be a fact that the colored people of this country know and understand the white people better than the white people know and understand them. I now think that this change which came into my life was at first more subjective than objective. I do not think my friends at school changed so much toward me as I did toward them. I grew reserved, I might say suspicious. I grew constantly more and more afraid of laying myself open to some injury to my feelings or my pride. I frequently saw or fancied some slight where, I am sure, none was intended. On the other hand, my friends and teachers were, if anything different, more considerate of me. But I can remember that it was against this very attitude in particular that my sensitiveness revolted. Red was the only one who did not so wound me. Up to this day I recall with a swelling heart his clumsy efforts to make me understand that nothing could change his love for me. I am sure that at this time the majority of my white schoolmates did not understand or appreciate any differences between me and themselves. But there were a few who had evidently received instructions at home on the matter, and more than once they displayed their knowledge in word and action. As the years passed, I noticed that the most innocent and ignorant among the others grew in wisdom. I myself would not have so clearly understood this difference had it not been for the presence of the other colored children at school. I had learned what their status was, and now I learned that theirs was mine. I had had no particular like or dislike for these black and brown boys and girls. In fact, with the exception of Shiny, they had occupied very little of my thought. But I do know that when the blow fell, I had a very strong aversion to being classed with them. So I became something of a solitary. Red and I remained inseparable, and there was between Shiny and me a sort of sympathetic bond, but my intercourse with the others was never entirely free from a feeling of constraint. I must add, however, that this feeling was confined almost entirely to my intercourse with boys and girls of about my own age. I did not experience it with my seniors. And when I grew to manhood, I found myself freer with elderly white people than with those near my own age. I was now about eleven years old, but these emotions and impressions which I have just described could not have been stronger or more distinct at an older age. There were two immediate results of my forced loneliness. I began to find company in books and greater pleasure in music. I made the former discovery through a big, gilt-bound, illustrated copy of the Bible, which used to lie in splendid neglect on the center table in our little parlor. On top of the Bible lay a photograph album. I had often looked at the pictures in the album, and one day, after taking the larger book down and opening it on the floor, I was overjoyed to find that it contained what seemed to be an inexhaustible supply of pictures. I looked at these pictures many times. In fact, so often that I knew the story of each one without having to read the subject. And then somehow I picked up the thread of history on which are strung the trials and tribulations of the Hebrew children. This I followed with feverish interest and excitement. For a long time King David, with Samson a close second, stood at the head of my list of heroes. He was not displaced until I came to know Robert the Bruce. I read a good portion of the Old Testament, all that part treating of wars and rumors of wars, and then started in on the new. I became interested in the life of Christ, but became impatient and disappointed when I found that, notwithstanding the great power he possessed, he did not make use of it when, in my judgment, he most needed to do so. And so my first general impression of the Bible was what my later impression has been of a number of modern books, that the authors put their best work in the first part and grew either exhausted or careless toward the end. After reading the Bible, or those parts which held my attention, I began to explore the glass-doored bookcase which I have already mentioned. I found there Pilgrim's Progress, Peter Parley's History of the United States, Grimm's Household Stories, Tales of a Grandfather, a bound volume of an old English publication, I think it was called The Mirror, a little volume called Familiar Science, and Somebody's Natural Theology, which last, of course, I could not read, but which, nevertheless, I tackled with the result of gaining a permanent dislike for all kinds of theology. There were several other books of no particular name or merit, such as agents sell to people who know nothing of buying books. 
how my mother came by this little library, which, considering all things, was so well suited to me, I never sought to know. But she was far from being an ignorant woman, and had herself, very likely, read the majority of these books, though I do not remember ever seeing her with a book in her hand, with the exception of the Episcopal prayer book. At any rate, she encouraged in me the habit of reading, and when I had about exhausted those books in the little library which interested me, she began to buy books for me. She also regularly gave me money to buy a weekly paper which was then very popular for boys. At this time I went in for music with an earnestness worthy of maturer years. A change of teachers was largely responsible for this. I began now to take lessons of the organist of the church which I attended with my mother. He was a good teacher and quite a thorough musician. He was so skillful in his instruction and filled me with such enthusiasm that my progress, these are his words, was marvelous. I remember that when I was barely twelve years old, I appeared on a program with a number of adults at an entertainment given for some charitable purpose and carried off the honors. I did more. I brought upon myself through the local newspapers the handicapping title of Infant Prodigy. I can believe that I did astonish my audience, for I never played the piano like a child, that is, in the one-two-three style with accelerated motion. Neither did I depend upon mere brilliancy of technique, a trick by which children often surprise their listeners. But I always tried to interpret a piece of music. I always played with feeling. Very early I acquired that knack of using the pedals which makes the piano a sympathetic singing instrument, quite a different thing from the source of hard or blurred sounds it so generally is. I think this was due not entirely to natural artistic temperament, but largely to the fact that I did not begin to learn the piano by counting out exercises, but by trying to reproduce the quaint songs which my mother used to sing, with all their pathetic turns and cadences. Even at a tender age, in playing, I helped to express what I felt by some of the mannerisms which I afterwards observed in great performers. I had not copied them. I have often heard people speak of the mannerisms of musicians as affectations adopted for mere effect. In some cases they may be so, but a true artist can no more play upon the piano or violin without putting his whole body in accord with the emotions he is striving to express then a swallow can fly without being graceful. Often when playing I could not keep the tears which formed in my eyes from rolling down my cheeks. Sometimes at the end or even in the midst of a composition, as big a boy as I was, I would jump from the piano and throw myself sobbing into my mother's arms. She, by her caresses and often her tears, only encouraged these fits of sentimental hysteria. Of course, to counteract this tendency to temperamental excesses, I should have been out playing ball, or in, swimming with other boys of my age. But my mother didn't know that. There was only once when she was really firm with me, making me do what she considered was best. I did not want to return to school after the unpleasant episode which I have related, and she was inflexible. I began my third term, and the days ran along as I have already indicated. I had been promoted twice, and had managed each time to pull Red along with me. I think the teachers came to consider me the only hope of his ever getting through school, and I believe they secretly conspired with me to bring about the desired end. At any rate, I know it became easier in each succeeding examination for me not only to assist Red, but absolutely to do his work. It is strange how, in some things, honest people can be dishonest without the slightest compunction. I knew boys at school who were too honorable to tell a fib, even when one would have been just the right thing, but could not resist the temptation to assist or receive assistance in an examination. I have long considered it the highest proof of honesty in a man to hand his streetcar fare to the conductor who had overlooked it. One afternoon after school, during my third term, I rushed home in a great hurry to get my dinner and go to my music teachers. I was never reluctant about going there, but on this particular afternoon I was impetuous. The reason of this was I had been asked to play the accompaniment for a young lady who was to play a violin solo at a concert given by the young people of the church, and on this afternoon we were to have our first rehearsal. 
At that time, playing accompaniments was the only thing in music I did not enjoy. Later, this feeling grew into positive dislike. I have never been a really good accompanist because my ideas of interpretation were always too strongly individual. I constantly forced my accelerandos and rubatos upon the soloist, often throwing the duet entirely out of gear. Perhaps the reader has already guessed why I was so willing and anxious to play the accompaniment to this violin solo. If not, the violinist was a girl, of seventeen or eighteen, whom I had first heard play a short time before on a Sunday afternoon at a special service of some kind, and who had moved me to a degree which now I can hardly think of as possible. At present I do not think it was due to her wonderful playing, though I judge she must have been a very fair performer. But there was just the proper setting to produce the effect upon a boy such as I was. The half-dim church, the air of devotion on the part of the listeners, the heaving tremor of the organ under the clear wail of the violin, and she, her eyes almost closing, the escaping strands of her dark hair wildly framing her pale face, and her slender body swaying to the tones she called forth, all combined to fire my imagination and my heart with a passion though boyish, yet strong and somehow lasting. I have tried to describe the scene. If I have succeeded, it is only half success, for words can only partially express what I wish to convey. Always in recalling that Sunday afternoon, I am subconscious of a faint but distinct fragrance which, like some old memory-awakening perfume, rises and suffuses my whole imagination inducing a state of reverie so airy as just to evade the powers of expression. She was my first love, and I loved her as only a boy loves. I dreamed of her. I built air castles for her. She was the incarnation of each beautiful heroine I knew. When I played the piano, it was to her. Not even music furnished an adequate outlet for my passion. I bought a new notebook and to sing her praises made my first and last attempts at poetry. I remember one day at school, after we had given in our notebooks to have some exercises corrected, the teacher called me to her desk and said, I couldn't correct your exercises because I found nothing in your book but a rhapsody on somebody's brown eyes. I had passed in the wrong notebook. I don't think I have felt greater embarrassment in my whole life than I did at that moment. I was ashamed not only that my teacher should see this nakedness of my heart, but that she should find out that I had any knowledge of such affairs. It did not then occur to me to be ashamed of the kind of poetry I had written. Of course, the reader must know that all of this adoration was in secret. Next to my great love for this young lady was the dread that in some way she would find it out. I did not know what some men never find out, that the woman who cannot discern when she is loved has never lived. It makes me laugh to think how successful I was in concealing it all. Within a short time after our duet, all of the friends of my dear one were referring to me as her little sweetheart, or her little beau, and she laughingly encouraged it. This did not entirely satisfy me. I wanted to be taken seriously. I had definitely made up my mind that I should never love another woman, and that if she deceived me, I should do something desperate. The great difficulty was to think of something sufficiently desperate. And the heartless jade? How she led me on. So I hurried home that afternoon, humming snatches of the violin part of the duet, my heart beating with pleasurable excitement over the fact that I was going to be near her, to have her attention placed directly upon me, that I was going to be of service to her, and in a way in which I could show myself to advantage. This last consideration has much to do with cheerful service. The anticipation produced in me a sensation somewhat between bliss and fear. I rushed through the gate, took the three steps to the house at one bound, threw open the door, and was about to hang my cap upon its accustomed peg of the hall rack when I noticed that that particular peg was occupied by a black derby hat. I stopped suddenly and gazed at this hat as though I had never seen an object of its description. I was still looking at it in open-eyed wonder when my mother, coming out of the parlor into the hallway, called me and said there was someone inside who wanted to see me. Feeling that I was being made a party to some kind of mystery, 
I went in with her, and there I saw a man standing, leaning with one elbow on the mantel, his back partly turned toward the door. As I entered, he turned, and I saw a tall, handsome, well-dressed gentleman of perhaps thirty-five. He advanced a step toward me with a smile on his face. I stopped and looked at him with the same feelings with which I had looked at the derby hat, except that they were greatly magnified. I looked at him from head to foot, but he was an absolute blank to me until my eyes rested on his slender, elegant, polished shoes. Then it seemed that indistinct and partly obliterated films of memory began, at first slowly, then rapidly to unroll, forming a vague panorama of my childhood days in Georgia. My mother broke the spell by calling me by name and saying, This is your father. 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 That was the word which had been to me a source of doubt and perplexity ever since the interview with my mother on the subject. How often I had wondered about my father, who he was, what he was like, whether alive or dead, and above all, why she would not tell me about him. More than once I had been on the point of recalling to her the promise she had made me, but I instinctively felt that she was happier for not telling me, and that I was happier for not being told. Yet I had not the slightest idea what the real truth was. And here he stood before me, just the kind of looking father I had wishfully pictured him to be. But I made no advance toward him. I stood there feeling embarrassed and foolish, not knowing what to say or do. I am not sure, but that he felt pretty much the same. My mother stood at my side with one hand on my shoulder, almost pushing me forward, but I did not move. I can well remember the look of disappointment, even pain on her face, and I can now understand that she could expect nothing else but that at the name Father I should throw myself into his arms. But I could not rise to this dramatic, or better, melodramatic climax. Somehow I could not arouse any considerable feeling of need for a father. He broke the awkward tableau by saying, Well, boy, aren't you glad to see me? He evidently meant the words kindly enough, but I don't know what he could have said that would have had a worse effect. However, my good breeding came to my rescue, and I answered, Yes, sir, and went to him and offered him my hand. He took my hand into one of his, and with the other stroked my head, saying that I had grown into a fine youngster. He asked me how old I was, which, of course, he must have done merely to say something more, or perhaps he did so as a test of my intelligence. I replied, Twelve, sir. He then made the trite observation about the flight of time, and we lapsed into another awkward pause. My mother was all in smiles. I believe that was one of the happiest moments of her life. Either to put me more at ease or to show me off, she asked me to play something for my father. There is only one thing in the world that can make music at all times and under all circumstances up to its general standard. That is, a hand organ or one of its variations. I went to the piano and played something in a listless, half-hearted way. I simply was not in the mood. I was wondering, while playing, when my mother would dismiss me and let me go. But my father was so enthusiastic in his praise that he touched my vanity, which was great. And more than that, he displayed that sincere appreciation which always arouses an artist to his best effort. And too, in an unexplainable manner, makes him feel like shedding tears. I showed my gratitude by playing for him a Chopin waltz with all the feeling that was in me. When I had finished, my mother's eyes were glistening with tears. My father stepped across the room, seized me in his arms, and squeezed me to his breast. I am certain that for that moment he was proud to be my father. He sat and held me standing between his knees while he talked to my mother. I, in the meantime, "'examined him with more curiosity, perhaps, than politeness. "'I interrupted the conversation by asking, "'Mother, is he going to stay with us now?' "'I found it impossible to frame the word father. "'It was too new to me. "'So I asked the question through my mother. "'Without waiting for her to speak, my father answered, "'I've got to go back to New York this afternoon, "'but I'm coming to see you again.' "'I turned abruptly and went over to my mother.' and almost in a whisper reminded her that I had an appointment which I should not miss. To my pleasant surprise, she said she would give me something to eat at once so that I might go. 
She went out of the room, and I began to gather from off the piano the music I needed. When I had finished, my father, who had been watching me, asked, Are you going? I replied, Yes, sir. I've got to go to practice for a concert. He spoke some words of advice to me about being a good boy and taking care of my mother when I grew up, and added that he was going to send me something nice from New York. My mother called, and I said goodbye to him and went out. I saw him only once after that. I quickly swallowed down what my mother had put on the table for me, seized my cap and music, and hurried off to my teacher's house. On the way, I could think of nothing but this new father, where he came from, where he had been, why he was here, and why he would not stay. In my mind, I ran over the whole list of fathers I had become acquainted with in my reading, but I could not classify him. The thought did not cross my mind that he was different from me, and even if it had, the mystery would not thereby have been explained. For notwithstanding my changed relations with most of my schoolmates, I had only a faint knowledge of prejudice, and no idea at all how it ramified and affected our entire social organism. I felt, however, that there was something about the whole affair which had to be hid. When I arrived, I found that she of the brown eyes had been rehearsing with my teacher and was on the point of leaving. My teacher, with some expressions of surprise, asked why I was late, and I stammered out the first deliberate lie of which I have any recollection. I told him that when I reached home from school, I found my mother quite sick, and that I had stayed with her a while before coming. Then, unnecessarily and gratuitously, to give my words force of conviction, I suppose, I added, I don't think she'll be with us very long. In speaking these words, I must have been comical, for I noticed that my teacher, instead of showing signs of anxiety or sorrow, half hid a smile. But how little did I know that in that lie I was speaking a prophecy. She of the brown eyes unpacked her violin, and we went through the duet several times. I was soon lost to all other thoughts in the delights of music and love. I saw delights of love without reservation, for at no time of life is love so pure, so delicious, so poetic, so romantic as it is in boyhood. A great deal has been said about the heart of a girl when she stands where the brook and river meet, but what she feels is negative. More interesting is the heart of a boy when just at the budding dawn of manhood, he stands looking wide-eyed into the long vistas opening before him. When he first becomes conscious of the awakening and quickening of strange desires and unknown powers, when what he sees and feels is still shadowy and mystical enough to be intangible, and so more beautiful, when his imagination is unsullied and his faith new and whole, then it is that love wears a halo. The man who has not loved before he was fourteen has missed a foretaste of Elysium. When I reached home, it was quite dark, and I found my mother without a light, sitting rocking in a chair, as she so often used to do in my childhood days, looking into the fire and singing softly to herself. I nestled close to her, and with her arms round me, she haltingly told me who my father was. A great man, a fine gentleman. He loved me, and loved her very much. He was going to make a great man of me. All she said was so limited by reserve and so colored by her feelings that it was but half-truth, and so I did not yet fully understand. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man Perhaps I ought not pass on in this narrative without mentioning that the duet was a great success, so great that we were obliged to respond with two encores. It seemed to me that life could hold no greater joy than it contained when I took her hand and we stepped down to the front of the stage, bowing to our enthusiastic audience. When we reached the little dressing room, where the other performers were applauding as wildly as the audience, she impulsively threw both her arms around me and kissed me, while I struggled to get away. One day, a couple of weeks after my father had been to see us, a wagon drove up to our cottage loaded with a big box. I was about to tell the men on the wagon that they had made a mistake when my mother, acting darkly wise, told them to bring their load in. She had them unpack the box, and quickly there was a vault from the boards, paper, and other packing material, and a beautiful brand-new upright piano. 
Then she informed me that it was a present to me from my father. I at once sat down and ran my fingers over the keys. The full mellow tone of the instrument was ravishing. I thought almost remorsefully of how I had left my father. But even so, there momentarily crossed my mind a feeling of disappointment that the piano was not a grand. The new instrument greatly increased the pleasure of my hours of study and practice at home. Shortly after this, I was made a member of the boys' choir, it being found that I possessed a clear, strong soprano voice. I enjoyed the singing very much. About a year later, I began the study of the pipe organ and the theory of music. And before I finished the grammar school, I had written out several simple preludes for organ, which won the admiration of my teacher, and which he did me the honor to play at services. The older I grew, the more thought I gave to the question of my mother's and my position, and what was our exact relation to the world in general. My idea of the whole matter was rather hazy. My study of the United States history had been confined to those periods which were designated in my book as discovery, colonial, revolutionary, and constitutional. I now began to study about the Civil War, but the story was told in such a condensed and skipping style that I gained from it very little real information. It is a marvel how children ever learn any history out of books of that sort. And, too, I began now to read the newspapers. I often saw articles which aroused my curiosity but did not enlighten me. But one day I drew from the circulating library a book that cleared the whole mystery, a book that I read with the same feverish intensity with which I had read the old Bible stories, a book that gave me my first perspective of the life I was entering. That book was Uncle Tom's Cabin. This work of Harriet Beecher Stowe has been the object of much unfavorable criticism. It has been assailed not only as fiction of the most imaginative sort, but as being a direct misrepresentation. Several successful attempts have lately been made to displace the book from northern school libraries. Its critics would brush it aside with the remark that there never was a Negro as good as Uncle Tom, nor a slaveholder as bad as Legree. For my part, I was never an admirer of Uncle Tom, nor of his type of goodness. But I believe that there were lots of old Negroes as foolishly good as he. The proof of which is that they knowingly stayed and worked the plantations that furnished sinews for the army which was fighting to keep them enslaved. But in these later years several cases have come to my personal knowledge in which old Negroes have died and left what was a considerable fortune to the descendants of their former masters. I do not think it takes any great stretch of the imagination to believe there was a fairly large class of slaveholders typified in Legree, and we must also remember that the author depicted a number of worthless, if not vicious, Negroes, and a slaveholder who was as much of a Christian and a gentleman as it was possible for one in his position to be, that she pictured the happy, singing, shuffling darky, as well as the mother wailing for her child sold down river. I do not think it is claiming too much to say that Uncle Tom's Cabin was a fair and truthful panorama of slavery. However that may be, it opened my eyes as to who and what I was and what my country considered me. In fact, it gave me my bearing. But there was no shock. I took the whole revelation in a kind of stoical way. One of the greatest benefits I derived from reading the book was that I could afterwards talk frankly with my mother on all the questions which had been vaguely troubling my mind. As a result, she was entirely freed from reserve, and often herself brought up the subject, talking of things directly touching her life and mine, and of things which had come down to her through the old folks. What she told me interested and even fascinated me, and what may seem strange kindled in me a strong desire to see the South. She spoke to me quite frankly about herself, my father, and myself. She, the sewing girl of my father's mother. He, an impetuous young man, home from college. I, the child of his unsanctioned love. She told me, even, the principal reason for our coming north. My father was about to be married to a young lady of another great southern family. She did not neglect to add that another reason for our being in Connecticut was that he intended to give me an education and make a man of me. In none of her talks did she ever utter one word of complaint against my father. She always endeavored to impress upon me how good he had been, and still was, and that he was all to us that custom and the law would allow. She loved him, 
more she worshipped him, and she died firmly believing that he loved her more than any other woman in the world. Perhaps she was right. Who knows? All of these newly awakened ideas and thoughts took the form of a definite aspiration on the day I graduated from the grammar school. And what a day that was! The girls in white dresses with fresh ribbons in their hair, the boys in new suits and creaky shoes, the great crowd of parents and friends, the flowers, the prizes and congratulations made the day seem to me one of the greatest importance. I was on the program and played a piano solo which was received by the audience with that amount of applause which I had come to look upon as being only the just due of my talent. But the real enthusiasm was aroused by Shiny. He was the principal speaker of the day, and well did he measure up to the honor. He made a striking picture, that thin little black boy standing on the platform, dressed in clothes that did not fit him any too well, his eyes burning with excitement, his shrill musical voice vibrating in tones of appealing defiance, and his black face alight with such great intelligence and earnestness as to be positively handsome. What were his thoughts when he stepped forward and looked into that crowd of faces, all white, with the exception of a score or so that were lost to view? I do not know, but I fancy he felt his loneliness. I think there must have rushed over him a feeling akin to that of a gladiator, tossed into the arena and bade to fight for his life. I think that solitary little black figure standing there felt that for the particular time and place he bore the weight and responsibility of his race that for him to fail meant general defeat. But he won, and nobly. His oration was Wendell Phillips' Toussaint L'Ouverture, a speech which may now be classed as rhetorical, even, perhaps, bombastic. But as the words fell from Shiny's lips, their effect was magical. How so young an orator could stir so great enthusiasm was to be wondered at. When, in the famous peroration, his voice trembling with suppressed emotion rose higher and higher and then rested on the name Toussaint L'Ouverture, it was like touching an electric button which loosed the pent-up feelings of his listeners. They actually rose to him. I have since known of colored men who have been chosen as class orators in our leading universities, of others who have played on the varsity football and baseball teams of colored speakers who have addressed great white audiences. In each of these instances, I believe the men were stirred by the same emotions which actuated Shiny on the day of his graduation. And too, in each case where the efforts have reached any high standard of excellence, they have been followed by the same phenomenon of enthusiasm. I think the explanation of the latter lies in what is a basic, though often dormant, principle of the Anglo-Saxon heart love of fair play. Shiny, it is true, was what is so common in his race, a natural orator. But I doubt that any white boy of equal talent could have wrought the same effect. The sight of that boy gallantly waging with puny black arms so unequal a battle touched the deep springs in the hearts of his audience, and they were swept by a wave of sympathy and admiration. But the effect upon me of Shiny's speech was double. I not only shared the enthusiasm of his audience, but he imparted to me some of his own enthusiasm. I felt leap within me, pride that I was colored, and I began to form wild dreams of bringing glory and honor to the Negro race. For days I could talk of nothing else with my mother except my ambitions to be a great man, a great colored man, to reflect credit on the race and gain fame for myself. It was not until years after that I formulated a definite and feasible plan for realizing my dreams. I entered the high school with my class and still continued my study of the piano, the pipe organ, and the theory of music. I had to drop out of the boys' choir on account of a changing voice. This I regretted very much. As I grew older, my love for reading grew stronger. I read with studious interest everything I could find relating to colored men who had gained prominence. My heroes had been King David, then Robert the Bruce. Now Frederick Douglass was enshrined in the place of honor. When I learned that Alexandre Dumas was a colored man, I reread Monte Cristo and the Three Guardsmen with magnified pleasure. I lived between my music and books, on the whole, a rather unwholesome life for a boy to lead. 
I dwelt in a world of imagination, of dreams and air castles, the kind of atmosphere that sometimes nourishes a genius, more often men unfitted for the practical struggles of life. I never played a game of ball, never went fishing or learned to swim. In fact, the only outdoor exercise in which I took any interest was skating. Nevertheless, though slender, I grew well-formed and in perfect health. After I entered the high school, I began to notice the change in my mother's health, which I suppose had been going on for some years. She began to complain a little and to cough a great deal. She tried several remedies and finally went to see a doctor. But though she was failing in health, she kept her spirits up. She still did a great deal of sewing, and in the busy seasons hired two women to help her. The purpose she had formed of having me go through college without financial worries kept her at work when she was not fit for it. I was so fortunate as to be able to organize a class of eight or ten beginners on the piano, and so start a separate little fund of my own. As the time for my graduation from the high school grew nearer, the plans for my college career became the chief subject of our talks. I sent for catalogues of all the prominent schools in the East and eagerly gathered all the information I could concerning them from different sources. My mother told me that my father wanted me to go to Harvard or Yale. She herself had a half-desire for me to go to Atlanta University, and even had me write for a catalog of that school. There were two reasons, however, that inclined her to my father's choice. The first, that at Harvard or Yale I should be near her. The second, that my father had promised to pay for a part of my college education. Both Shiny and Red came to my house quite often of evenings, and we used to talk over our plans and prospects for the future. Sometimes I would play for them, and they seemed to enjoy the music very much. My mother often prepared sundry southern dishes for them, which I am not sure but that they enjoyed more. Shiny had an uncle in Amherst, Massachusetts, and he expected to live with him and work his way through Amherst College. Red declared that he had enough of school, and that after he got his high school diploma, he would get a position in a bank. It was his ambition to become a banker, and he felt sure of getting the opportunity through certain members of his family. My mother barely had strength to attend the closing exercises of the high school when I graduated, and after that day she was seldom out of bed. She could no longer direct her work, and under the expense of medicines, doctors, and someone to look after her, our college fund began to diminish rapidly. Many of her customers and some of the neighbors were very kind and frequently brought her nourishment of one kind or another. My mother realized what I did not, that she was mortally ill, and she had me write a long letter to my father. For some time past, she had heard from him only at irregular intervals. We never received an answer. In those last days, I often sat at her bedside and read to her until she fell asleep. Sometimes I would leave the parlor door open and play on the piano just loud enough for the music to reach her. This she always enjoyed. One night, near the end of July, after I had been watching beside her for some hours, I went into the parlor and, throwing myself into the big armchair, dozed off into a fitful sleep. I was suddenly aroused by one of the neighbors who had come in to sit with her that night. She said, Come to your mother at once. I hurried upstairs, and at the bedroom door met the woman who was acting as nurse. I noted with a dissolving heart the strange look of awe on her face. From my first glance at my mother, I discerned the light of death upon her countenance. I fell upon my knees beside the bed, and burying my face in the sheets, sobbed convulsively. She died with the fingers of her left hand entwined in my hair. I will not rake over this, one of the two sacred sorrows of my life, nor could I describe the feeling of unutterable loneliness that fell upon me. After the funeral, I went to the house of my music teacher. He had kindly offered me the hospitality of his home for so long as I might need it. A few days later, I moved my trunk, piano, my music, and most of my books to his home. The rest of my books I divided between Shiny and Red. Some of the household effects I gave to Shiny's mother and to two or three of the neighbors who had been kind to us during my mother's illness. The others I sold. After settling up my little estate, I found that besides a good supply of clothes, a piano, some books, and trinkets, 
I had about two hundred dollars in cash. The question of what I was to do now confronted me. My teacher suggested a concert tour, but both of us realized that I was too old to be exploited as an infant prodigy, and too young and inexperienced to go before the public as a finished artist. He, however, insisted that the people of the town would generously patronize a benefit concert, so he took up the matter and made arrangements for such an entertainment. A more than sufficient number of people with musical and elocutionary talent volunteered their services to make a program. Among these was my brown-eyed violinist, but our relations were not the same as they were when we had played our first duet together. A year or so after that time, she had dealt me a crushing blow by getting married. I was partially avenged, however, by the fact that, though she was growing more beautiful, she was losing her ability to play the violin. I was down on the program for one number. My selection might have appeared at that particular time as a bit of affectation, but I considered it deeply appropriate. I played Beethoven's Sonata Pathétique. When I sat down at the piano and glanced into the faces of the several hundreds of people who were there solely on account of love or sympathy for me, emotions swelled in my heart which enabled me to play the pathétique as I could never again play it. When the last tone died away, the few who began to applaud were hushed by the silence of the others, and for once I played without receiving an encore. The benefit yielded me a little more than two hundred dollars thus raising my cash capital to about four hundred dollars. I still held to my determination of going to college, so it was now a question of trying to squeeze through a year at Harvard or going to Atlanta, where the money I had would pay my actual expenses for at least two years. The peculiar fascination which the South held over my imagination and my limited capital decided me in favor of Atlanta University. So, about the last of September... I bade farewell to the friends and scenes of my boyhood and boarded a train for the South. End of chapter 3